A year is a long time. Yet, here we are, closing out another one. A little over a year ago, I started making videos about my STEM-based creature collector, Stemma. Since then, the channel grew to have over 90,000 people following the project. Thank you. Thanks to you, I've been able to continue making videos and pursuing a goal of possibly making a game out of these designs one day. It's nowhere near presentable yet, as I'm getting the hang of Godot after jumping out of Unity, but still, I'm glad I've been able to share various STEM topics with you through my designs. Now, this channel has shared over 80 STEMAs in my videos so far. There's gonna be many more, and while I have a playlist of the whole video essays on various tropes, this video is a compilation of the concepts and designs of my stemmas. I didn't include the segments of my starter trio because their segments are basically the entirety of the video. But after those stemmas, well, let's get this compilation started. We're starting with Igneo, an igneous stone, just a pure geotype. Igneous rocks are the ones that are formed through cooled magma or lava. Depending on how quickly they are cooled, there could be a lot of holes as gases are trying to seep out of it as it cools. Igneon here is also volcano shaped because even if I did want to add a fire type, it would lose it in the next stages anyway, so I kept it as a rock type, represented a lava with a shiny gem instead. Igneon evolves into Seti Slab, a sedimentary rock. These rocks are formed with layers and layers of grounded of sediment piling on top of each other, like sandstone or limestone. And that's why SETI Slab is flat. Originally, SETI Slab was supposed to be rock and ground type, but in my region, since they're both one type, this is still mono geotype. And finally, SETI Slab can turn into Metamolder, a metamorphic rock which is a rock that is subjected to high pressure and or temperature that the chemical bonds of the rock have changed significantly. Thus, the bands of SETI slab are now warped. There was some pressure and heat applied to it. This is Musmus, a small lap mouse with fur resembling a lap coat. They're wearing a lot of personal protective equipment, also known as PPE. Depending on the job, different PPE are required from goggles, gloves, closed-toed shoes, lab coats, but also hair ties, ear protections, helmet, respiratory masks, just to name a few. So that's the lab part of lab rats. What about the rat part? Well, I like. It's a lab mouse. Lab mice are more commonly used than lab rats nowadays, so here's Musculmus. Musculmus is muscular because the species name for the lab mouse is Mus musculus, which is the same name as a common house mouse. But don't worry, these mice aren't plucked out of their houses. Rather, these are special strains of mice bred for research purposes. I know a lot of quizzes like to ask why we use these mice as model organisms, which are species we use to test treatments on instead of testing on humans. Larving is a bunch of pixels, I guess, they're voxels because they aren't flat, but they're weaving up and down like a snake. But the name is actually referencing the Turing machine. Named after Alan Turing, the Turing machine is a model that can theoretically execute any computer algorithm. The simplest model would operate on a strip of symbols that it could read and write on, but the strip would have to be infinitely long to execute every algorithm conceivable. By the way, an algorithm just means a set of rules a program follows. I know people use it to mean stuff like recommended videos, but it actually means it's a set of rules that a search engine follows to make those recommendations. Anyways, our larva is making a little shell to become Compupa. This is where I barge in to say that I'm technically planning to make my own game one day, but all the stats and abilities here are related to Pokemon rules. Compupa is based off of the Commodore PET, which was one of the first personal computers. Before that, computers had to take up whole rooms just to work, but this was the beginning of the technological revolution. Ironically, the last stage of this line is the simplest to explain. Hacktera is like a cyberpunk hacker, and their wings are like a bunch of binary numbers. So why do computers use binary anyways? Binary means two, so there's only two kinds of numbers here, ones and zeros. In circuitry, these could be called being on and off. So let's start with position. This is position, 
a hummingbird who can stay in place while flying, like most hummingbirds. You see, I tried to give it a little position marker symbol, like the you are here marks on maps. So if I could tell where the position is at one point in time, and then the position at some time later, the rate of how much they moved is called velocity. Velocity is a vector, which means it has direction and magnitude. Speed alone is just the magnitude part of velocity, as velocity should also tell you in which direction you're going at that moment. So Velowing here has the fastest speed stat of the line, because the evolution is more about acceleration. Acceleration is also a vector. In fact, you could find acceleration just like how you found velocity from position. Just like how velocity was changed of position over time, acceleration is change in velocity over time. Now these delta symbols here, like the triangles in these formulas, those can be rewritten as something called derivatives, which tells you the slope of the function. But I'll have more on that in another video. Excelif doesn't have the highest base speed of its line, but I know a lot of Poké fans would know just how strong speed boost is. Yes, acceleration, getting faster every turn. No, getting slower is also considered acceleration. It's just that any change in velocity is called acceleration. But we've reached Melimit, which is a mushroom with arms that come up pointing towards their head. I made the head round as if it's a certain point on the graph, with the arms coming up on both ends like how the limit leads up to that point. My main goal is to represent the concept. And what does the slope at a certain point look like? A tangent line. Come on, artists should know what tangent lines mean, right? It kisses the graph at that one point and goes off. Thus, we have Derivite, here looking like a fairy stool mushroom with a flat top, even the ruffles look pretty flat. In their decks, I was thinking of having to walk off cliffs without falling like Looney Tunes style, as long as they don't change the direction that they're facing, because that's the slope they're traveling on. All this talk to show you the final evolution of Melimit, Entangle. The body is loosely referencing the big S that is the integral sign, but more importantly, the cap generates a veil to represent the area beneath a curve. I guess it would have been fun to somehow flip Derivite's design because this is an anti-derivative, but I already liked how it came out, and I thought the area part was the more memorable concept to capture. So mathematicians just called the square root of negative 1, I, standing for imaginary number. Square root of negative 25 would be 5 times i. Now this imaginary number deal might not fit into the real number line, but they can be depicted of having an axis of their own. This plane between the real and imaginary axis is called the complex plane. A solenoid, one of the basic shapes of an electromagnet. So here's solenite, a solenoid velamite. I made the bottom rounder to make this look more like a cute little electric wizard kind of a guy. My project is going to flip the sprites a lot, so in the lore, I'd say that their eyes change shape according to the shape that they make with their hands. The positive and negative ends in the eyes and hands are references to the caps on the battery. I've also rounded out the coils on the design, um, because I'll be flipping it a lot. Just know that in reality, it's a coil, not just independent donuts. And the same goes for its evolution, not toroid. Now, if you treated the solenoid like a cylinder and wrapped that cylinder around into a big donut, that's called a toroid. Again, the wire in reality is wrapped around. I turned them into knobs in this design. It made it cleaner and also flippable. I had the idea of making a chiptune chipmunk to feature different waveforms, namely the sine wave, square wave, saw wave, and noises, which were the main kind of waveforms you see in chiptune music. Chipu is an electric normal type, a loud chiptune chipmunk featuring volume bars for ears and a wavy tail. They can open up their mouths quite a lot to belt out annoyingly loud songs like the nerd they are. In snapdragon flowers, the colors of their petals don't seem to follow Mendelian genetics. So let me first introduce you to the two different forms of Snapeel. No stat changes, just purely cosmetic where one is pigmented to be red and the other is blank. 
Now, Snapdragon flowers go under something called incomplete dominance. Instead of one of the alleles dominating over the other, if two different alleles are present in the child, that child shows a mixture of the phenotypes. This is different from co-dominance, where both of the phenotypes both coexist in the offspring. No, in incomplete dominance, there's like an intermediate phenotype that's not like either of the two alone. Instead of red or white, this offspring is pink. I mean, the offspring are still the same species. They're still snapdragons. They're not hybrid species. They're just hybrid in terms of their genotype. Like hybrid here. I used to have the evolution requirement be trading one type of snapeel with the other, but I don't think I'll implement trading when I do make this into an independent game. Precision is all about hitting similar values again and again. It's all about consistency rather than aiming for any value. So here's Gekku, who is always a mono poison type actually. Its new ability powers up the same moves that are used over and over, kind of like how the metronome item works in Pokemon. The design also has dots that are off the target, but they're close to each other because precision is all about how close the dots are, not really caring about how close they are to the target. That would be accuracy. Gunkerit used to be part dragon for having a real gun, like drag gun, but it's just poison type once again. They have ridges on their head to steady their tail to take their aim accurately. Accuracy is all about hitting a target. Now, if the data collected was really accurate to a target you were hoping to get, naturally, that batch of data would be very precise as well. But So here's Drakul, the first stage out of two of my fireworks mon. Drakul is based off of one of those fireworks shells. Drakul used to evolve into a levitating fire dragon, but now they are just fully fire flying type or in other words, pyro arrow type. And they are now a comet fireworks display. There are several types of fireworks, of course, and they're all dependent on how the shell's contents were organized, how the fuse inside was timed, and what metal powders were burned. Just to name a few, burning strontium makes red, calcium orange, barium makes green, and copper makes blue. And of course, you could have mixtures of the powders to make different color patterns. So what does light do in a double slit? With no observers, when one photon is sent out, you just get one dot on the detector. Which makes sense because you only sent out one photon. But if you send out a lot of them, weirdly all the dots make up an interference pattern as if it's kind of traveling like a wave. But if you put an observer where the slits are and you start to know which slit the particle is going through, Suddenly, the detector now gets readings all over the place, as if the photons were traveling like particles. So here's Fatora. Their main gimmick was that they turned into a particle sling fire type into a wave spewing electric type. How do they switch forms? Well, I'm going to lie to you today and just say that they switch according to their moves. I promise that the actual gimmick I have in mind is much more of a reference to the observer in the double slit experiment, but I'm not ready to explain my game as of now. So Blip Pup here is a dog fennec fox thing with big ol' ears to listen to sounds that are far away. Oh, and the ability? Haha, <laughs> what do you mean? It just has anticipation like it knows the forecast. Ha, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally not lying. Alright, alright, so I know that I showed you that it should have Doppler effect as the ability. So what is the Doppler effect? I could go over that at least. Since sound is a wave, when the source of the sound versus your current position changes, the wave you experience would change. When an ambulance siren comes towards you, the sound waves get to you sooner than if the ambulance and you were just still. So the sound gets a higher frequency. And when the ambulance is moving away from you, that sound wave needs to travel a longer distance to get to you, making that sound have a lower frequency. Blip Pup's evolution. I won't tell you what this ability does. It's not the same as Pokemon's anticipation at all. But again, I'm not ready to explain how my game works just yet. We need to cook. So here's Moel, who's a mole. Of course, not just the animal, but it's also a reference to the mole, which is a unit of quantity in chemistry. But to explain what a mole is, I need to talk about Avogadro's number. 
It's like the word dozen, where a dozen of something is 12 of that thing. And Avogadro's number's worth of something is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that thing. Why that crazy number? Because that's how many carbon atoms are in 12 grams of pure carbon. People decided to call that a mole of something, instead of an Avogadro's number's worth. Let me just dip mole in some water. And now we got molra, who represents molars, which is a unit of moles per liter. It's a unit of a concentration, like a dosage, like how strong your uh, orange juice is. It's how many of a specific kind of molecule would be in a liter's worth of the mixture you have. Kind of confusing how molar is spelt the same way as the adjective molar. So just look out for the capital M molar for the unit. Pipish here is a fish that's shaped like a pipette. There wasn't a particular species of fish in mind for this design, as opposed to their evolution. Uh-oh, time for another noob alert. You see, the pipette is deceptively simple. When you press down the knob, you're supposed to go only down to a certain point where you feel some resistance. You can push further, but then you'll be pulling up more than what the pipette is saying. You only need to push until you feel that resistance, and you only need to push further when you're spitting out the contents of the pipette to get the last drop. Here is Needleish, a water steel type. So here's Bunge, a fire type sponge that's a reference to hydrothermal vents. I'll go deeper into that some other day, but here, Bunge has two forms. A nice controlled flame like we have here where it's completely combusting the gas into CO2 and water. But if it's at low health, it starts doing incomplete combustion. In real life, this happens when your Bunsen burner gets too little air and you want to avoid this. The red flame is honestly weaker than the blue. It will start spouting out some smoke because in incomplete combustion, not all of the gas turns into carbon dioxide and water. Sometimes you get some byproducts like carbon monoxide, which is toxic. To burn. With these videos, I continue using Pokemon abilities, but yeah, they would have different effects and or different names whenever I make my game in the distant future. The poison heal here is to reference how their survival off of hydrogen sulfide is toxic to others. But they evolve into a proper giant tube worm. Phantom worm. Now you might be wondering why the spy motif? Well, well it doesn't have to do with phantom worm being an extremophile. Here's the thing. Every time I want to reference a cool animal or a creature, I want to tie them with another science lesson if possible. So it's not just like, ooh, look at this crazy animal. So here's the little astronaut shaped not to grade, with an ability which references their anhydrobiosis, which just means drying themselves up, and cryosleep. This might be too strong of a gimmick, so I might change it in the future. It all depends on going through some play tests, which I am very far from starting. Thus the Bulben can withstand hammers and even bullets. However, the tail end is very thin and thus the tail could easily snap. And that one break would cause the rest of the glass to collapse on itself, making it explode. This structure is called Prince Rupert's Drop. It can also happen naturally with rapidly cooled lava called Pele's Tears. So here's Droppert with their signature ability Resilient, which maxes out their physical defense stages when they enter battle. Now I'll just add that no other species can copy or steal their stats like through Pokemon's move Psych Up, but otherwise Dropper's physical wall would shatter once you land a critical move, just like a Prince Rupert's drop. If you die to DNA, put them in a gel, and run an electric current through them, over time you can see the bands separate as the shorter segments grow through the gel more quickly than the longer ones do. This is where I finally get to show you my Stemamon. Jelter, a slimy fish with gel all around them, with bands going across their back representing the separated bands of DNA. I call this a hydrophasma type, as I aim to make my own game with these creatures one day. And Jelter is actually based off of the hagfish, which secretes slime as part of their defenses. Aerogel, the skeleton of a gel. They are fantastic thermal insulators due to all the air inside of them. So, Jelter evolves into Gelero, 
the Aero Phasma type. I personally wanted an encompassing insulator ability that blocks both electro and pyro moves, but an aerogel could be made up of various materials, including graphene, which would make it electrically conductive. So the ability here is specifically a thermal insulator. Phasorm, a Dumbo octopus that will demonstrate different states of matter. They're a pure hydro type in their liquid form, but get hit by a cryo move or when the weather starts to snow, they freeze solid becoming a hydro cryo type. You can melt them back into a liquid form with the pyro move or when the weather turns sunny, but do the same to the liquid form, then you'll vaporize it into a hydro aero type gas form. And this gaseous form can condense back down to a liquid when it starts to rain or snow or when they're hit with a cryo move. But here's the aero electro type plasorm where their head kind of shrunk due to losing some electrons. Now, I know there are Bose-Einstein condensates and other states of matter, but by then, you're not even working with the same substance, but rather specific subatomic particles that have their own properties. If anything, I was considering on having some kind of super cold mythical-like design that references Bose-Einstein condensates, but for this line, I'll just have the four fundamental states of matter. Anything that's hot radiates heat around it, allowing you to feel it without you actually touching it. So tuna rad here is a hot coil giving off heat. Now while touching the hot coil should be hot, that's another kind of heat transfer. Not exactly the point of radiation. So tuna rad is a pyro ghost type. They're just a source of heat that's weirdly hard to touch. So instead of letting you touch it and burn yourself, they could pass through obstacles, illuminate, and also call for harsh sunlight. Now hold on to your seat, cause these abilities are going to change a lot. Now, as a cast iron pan, you need to be a lot more careful to avoid touching tuna duct. There's that flame body into play. I'm using Pokemon lingo for the abilities, but I'll have my own names whenever I do make my own project in the distant future. Tuna duck also has flash fire, so that incoming fire attacks only powers them up. There's one more method of heat transfer I want to represent, which means that Tuna Rad has a branched evolution between conduction and convection. Convection is the transfer of heat through fluids, because when fluids like liquids and gases get heated, they become less dense and rise, transferring the heat from down below to up top, where that fluid may cool off and come back down, making this swirling pattern in the fluid. This is how weather patterns work, and that's how storms can be calculated to predict where they might go next. So here's Doling, a gluten duckling. Gluten refers to a specific group of proteins, which include the gliadin and glutenin proteins. By the way, when chemicals end with the letters IN, that's usually a sign for a protein or something related to proteins. Anyways, gliadin helps the bread rise. While the long glutenin can be linked with strong disulfide bonds, which allows the material to stretch without breaking. Gluten has been known to affect people with specific allergies and also those with celiac disease, where the proteins unfortunately cause some severe symptoms. If doling is at least level 25 and is burned while it's leveling up the next time, it turns into Maloaf, turning this dough into a fairy fire type. Not only are they a mallard duck, but they are demonstrating the Maillard reaction. It's when your food turns brown when you cook it. At a certain temperature, the proteins in the food melt and fuse with the sugars, making something called a flavonoid, and that's where you get that roasted flavor. Mmm, oh so good. Don't burn it though. That'll make acrylamide, which can cause cancer. So Minter, the mint man, made menthol, which makes you feel cold without dropping the temperature. And I thought that this would be the perfect opportunity to give it a rival. A pepper is another plant that makes another chemical, this time capsaicin, which makes you feel hot without raising the temperature. Capsol. As mentioned before, the chemical capsaicin triggers your heat receptors, which makes you feel hot without the temperature actually being hot. And oh, would you look at that, our first new ability. And since I mentioned them, Here's the slightly redesigned Minter. Mints make menthol instead, which triggers your cold receptors, making you feel colder. But it also makes you a bit numb, and it's sometimes used as an analgesic, a pain reliever. 
On an unrelated note, I buffed this ability a bit more just because of how bad ice type usually is compared to fire types, and reason that Minter is more like an air freshener which splayed out leaves and spreads menthol passively, while Capsol has to capsaicin in the peppers and requires them to attack with it to get the effect. So here's Sopal, who looks like a bar of soap and is now pure fairy type or charm type. Honestly, I could use some more monotypes in my project, especially since I don't have other designs to include. Unlike how Pokemon has the liberty of choosing between the hundreds of past designs to populate their next game with. So how does soap work? Well, soap is an emulsifier. The heck is an emulsifier? Alright, so you could try washing your hands with water, right? But some of the grime, especially oily grime, it won't come off well because, well, oil and water don't mix. Chemically, they're called being non-polar and polar, respectively. Soap is kind of a mediator. It has a polar head that could be pulled by water, and a non-polar tail, which could attach to oily grime. There are these formations called micelles, where they are essentially globs of oil contained in a coating of amphiphilic compounds like soap. These amphiphilic compounds are seen in quite a lot of places than you think. So, Sapopper so here, has these patterns with bubbles as decorations. Bogo Stork, you just shuffled the whole list randomly over and over again <laughs> with no thought in mind, no sense, just mashing the shuffle button again and again until it's all miraculously ordered. I mean, one of the combinations has to be right, right? So here's Mon Bogo, a monkey who would just mash buttons if it has the chance to. Don't put it near Compupa. This design also references that saying of giving a bunch of monkeys infinite time and infinite typewriters and they might randomly type Shakespeare out one day. Mombogo is just a normal type. One sorting method is called the tree sort, where you have a binary search tree. Placing the next number on the list either on the left or right of your other numbers after comparing that number with the tree that you're building. There's only two paths that the value could take, like it's either smaller or bigger than the number you're comparing with. Unless the number overlaps where you could just plop it right next to the other duplicate. So, a Telgo is a spider monkey that represents the binary search tree. Each limb has two spikes coming out. It used to be a normal bug type because of the spider aspect, but now, I don't know. I was thinking of making a normal psychic. Maybe even normal Dendro if I choose that name for the grass type, because Dendro means trees, but despite being a binary search trait, it does have a different flavor to it. Just having a weaponless battle bot roaming around might not have the most exciting shape, so I paired it with a scorpion to make a rampling. Ooh, now their tail might look like a shovel here, which is more of a class 3 lever and a wedge. More on those soon, but it's more based off of the inclined plane shape that the body has. You force pushing it down, which leads to the two other faces of the triangle to push outwards upon the material you're digging into. A Raxnit here now wields a more dangerous axe and has claws that can pierce the ground, unlike the smooth ones you could go over in the last design. So here's my final stage, Scroopion. I ended up making the tail screw drill omnidirectional, which is a rare kind of screw that can work by spinning clockwise and counterclockwise. I just wanted to maintain symmetry, as I'll be needing to flip sprites in the project that I'm working on. And there's also some publications said that it walked on the sharp spines. Truly the trippiest fossil of them all. Only in 2015 did researchers agree on which side was the real head and which side were the real legs. That's why Tripper here has a rear face forwards, and their legs also double up as spines. This trippy color scheme is actually a reference to an old Windows screensaver animation, thus it has screen cleaner for a hidden ability. I mean, if I do ever make my own game with these characters in the distant future, I'll have to rename abilities, change stats, these are just placeholders. Halodrome, a geopsychic type. Instead of going super offensive or defensive, I wanted this line to be as powerful supporter, with high speed and access to a bunch of status moves like stage hazards. So for the first stage here, this is Fisticot, based off of the Platicata, a species around the Triassic era that had yet to become more crab-like. There are still like this weird shrimp lobster kind of thing, but they got that fighting spirit. When they evolve though, their tail gets tucked underneath and they become more propped up, so we got Anodupes. 
who can swing their claw fists around and reduce their slower but more offensive than Halodrome. Meet Astro, a tiny alien on a nebulous cloud. Nebulae are clouds of gas and dust in space where new stars can be born from. Nebulae usually come from older stars exploding with a supernova, which sends out all sorts of matter throughout space that can later clump up and form new stars. Now, of the stars categorized by astronomers so far, many of these stars fall in the main sequence cluster, like our own sun, which is what Stellic here represents. You know that chart that I just showed? It's called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which charts stars based off of their surface temperature and luminosity, which is basically their brightness. There are several groups and patterns you can recognize the stars in, but for the final evolution, the one I want to be a boss encounter one day, is a giant. A red giant. When main sequences age, they exit that category in the diagram and can become a giant or even a supergiant, depending on how big the star originally was. Red supergiants can explode in a supernova, but smaller red giants can just emit layers off until all that's left is a dense white dwarf star, which I tried to reference with Giant Knot's core being their true face. To represent the sleep cycle, Slossum here has four forms. They would enter the battlefield in their dozing stage 1 form, but if they aren't inflicted by another status effect, they would continue into their other stages. When they enter the middling sleeping second stage, their defenses grow as their heart rate gets slower and body gets colder. Slossum can no longer be affected by any other condition from now on as they are effectively asleep. In the next stage, Slossum is in deep sleep, but they can still walk around because this is where sleepwalking occurs. But most importantly, they heal some fraction of their HP as deep sleep is when the body heals. And then they enter REM when they are dreaming and mentally active as they lower their defenses for offense. It's probably a gimmick that I need to playtest a lot in the future, but what I'm certain of right now is that I need some rest. Where there's a reflective yet transparent surface that presents the reflection on top of a 3D background. Pepper's Ghost has been around since the 1860s, but aren't considered to be a true hologram, though it is widely used in many attractions. So Mirpur is a singing note in the wind, with a vague pepper shape rising from the reflective panels around them. To prepare the plate, a laser is split into two beams. One reflects off the object of interest to the plate, and the other is directly shined onto the plate. The plate records the interference of the cross beams, so that when the same laser is shined onto the plate, the plate can recreate an image of that 3D object, complete with parallax. This imbalance is static electricity. Static means not moving because the imbalance charge remains to be separate as that static only gets released when the electrons find a surface to get out of you. So here's my baby raccoon Stukit who is hungry for electrons with their tail almost looking like a grabby hand. Though the abilities I have here are from Pokemon, they would have different names and or effects. And the reason why I gave Stukit plus here is because they're in need of electrons, where the electrons are negatively charged. Plus wants electrons. Prokion is no longer a baby and has minus as an ability because they are full of electrons. They also got a large spiky top, like how hair spreads out when somebody has a lot of static electricity because charges of the same type repel each other and having an excess of electrons makes the hair strands all negatively charged and repel each other. So here's Levestress, a coward of a bunny frozen in fear. When one is afraid, they activate their sympathetic nervous system, which increases their heart rate and dilates their pupils and muscles as they have a fight or flight response. It keeps your muscles ready for movement and big pupils to make you more aware of your surroundings. Speaking of fight or flight, 
Levestris can evolve into Lagal Might. Fight form if you win 5 encounters after a certain level, and flight form if you choose to run away 5 times instead. The sympathetic nervous response prepares you to encounter or avoid a dangerous situation, and while that's important to deal with the situation at hand, it's also important to get rest, or your body suffers by being in distressed state for too long. So I want a concept that's pretty representative of STEM without being so important that it should be a legend or something. So I ended up with a dragon. Now I don't have the dragon type in my own game, as I'm distancing my personal project from Pokemon, but the pun remains, is a dragon polygon, Dracogon. Polygons are two-dimensional shapes, while one dimension would be just a line, two allows for a whole plane of points. I ended up making it a square to represent the two dimensions. I was thinking of making a pure neurotype or pure spectral type, this is based off of mathematical dimensions. Honestly, the typing is pending. I usually put in abilities that I could equate from Pokemon, but now I think I'm gonna give it a signature ability that would be best revealed whenever I finish the game in years. Oh. <laughs> Lastly, Dracogon's lineless art is intentionally even flatter than the ones I've drawn for the others, cause it's 2D. Get to level 40 and you got Drachedron, a polyhedron, which are three dimensional shapes. That extra dimension gives it that volume as a cube floating around. So we go from 2D to 3D, and the only other place to go is up to 4 dimensions. While we interact in a spatially 3 dimensional world, having 4 spatial dimensions is harder to represent. Let's try something. You get a point, 0 dimensions. You define an axis, move it across it for a bit, now you got a line, 1 dimension. Draw another axis, this time perpendicular to the previous one. Now you got a square or a rectangle, two dimensions. Let's make things look nice and go with the regular square. Take the square, move it across another perpendicular axis, you get a cube, three dimensions. Now, ideally, we'll choose another perpendicular axis, but uh-oh, now they all overlap with the past axes. So for now, let's choose just a random axis just to see what creating a fourth dimension would look like. And you get a cube going across to another cube. Hmm. We go from a line to a polygon, to a polyhedron, to a polychoron. That's what four dimensional shapes are called. Now the square equivalent of a polychoron is called the tesseract. And what we have here is more like a parallelogram of the fourth dimension, right? It's like the slanted version. But another popular depiction of the tesseract is found by folding up a bunch of cubes. If a cube can't be made up of squares, a tesseract is made up of a bunch of cubes. But how do you fold up this bad boy? Well, it's hard to do in our world in perception, right? But imagine that you can smush those cubes into a shape that we can force ourselves to understand in our 3D world. And that last one ends up inverting itself to cover the rest of the shape. In the fourth dimension, none of these cubes are actually smushed. But in our 3D spatial world, they look smushed. Just like how squares look to be smushed when they're on the surfaces of a cube. So how did I make a mon based off of 4D? Drake Koran would have this film all around it, but I didn't want the silhouette to just look like one big square. So I figured that it could phase in and out as they're going across the additional spatial dimension that we can't see. Is the fourth dimension actually time, you may ask? Well, yeah, that's a way to look at it. But we're looking at for spatial dimension here, which is much harder to visualize, but if we were to force an understanding in our 3D space, we'd imagine it's something like the Tesseract. How are you experiencing this video right now? Whether you're seeing, hearing, or feeling the material of this very video, nay, of anything in life, how are you experiencing the world around you? The nervous system can be categorized into two parts. First part being the central nervous system, which is your brain and your spinal cord. The second part is all the other nerves in your body, called the peripheral nervous system. When the world activates your sensory receptor, that sensory neuron from the peripheral nervous system sends a signal through some nerves towards the central nervous system, where you can process that sense of taste, smell, sound, sight, or touch. Those nerves that send signals from the body towards your spine and brain are called afferent nerves, as you are affected by the world. 
Aphrosora represents how you take in the world around you, and they would have the power to change your senses. Their ability logical sensor would make them immune to moves that share a type as them, and make them gain health instead. However, if you want to make an effect in the world around you, your brain will send a signal down another set of nerves, from the central to the peripheral nervous system, towards your muscles to make movement. Those nerves are called efferent nerves. Effetor represents how you change the world around you, and they would have the power to change your motors. Their ability passionate motor would have them power through type immunities and abilities that grant immunities to still deal damage, but only when they're using moves that share the same type as them. Does passionate motor power through logical sensor? Sure, why not? Aphrosaur should resist those types anyways. There's going to be more designs to share in the future, and hopefully, I'll get to show you some other video essays and logs as this project evolves. Thank you again for sticking around. Stay safe this season, and I wish you an amazing new year.